Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the mental health podcast that's changing the discussion one voice at a time. Featuring guests that will help end the stigma and keep talking mental health. And now, here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, everybody. Good morning to you. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for tuning in to Voices for Change 2.0. We are happy to have you with us. Uh, Thanks for taking time out of your uh, possibly busy Saturday. I don't know. Maybe you're (laughs) you're doing nothing. Maybe you're sitting around and taking a load off from the stressful week that it's been. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> um, or maybe it is a busy day for you, and you're tuning in to us uh, just because cause you like us. <laughs> you really, really like us. Absolutely. So, sorry if I'm sniffy, uh, dealing with some allergies, so there, uh, there may be sneezing involved today. I, I can't guarantee there won't be. <laughs> um, can't guarantee there won't be uh, sniffing because you're hearing it now. Um, sorry about that. Sneezed right before we came on, so I didn't have a chance to go and indispose myself to take care of it. You'll be okay. Yeah. yeah. I have faith. That's good. At least one of us does. <laughs> so. so what do you want to chat about today, honey? Um, well, let's see. It's uh, July is almost halfway over already. It feels like mm-hmm. it just started. Uh, this year can't get done soon enough. Um, I'm That's waiting sure. to waiting to see what the next great disaster is going to be uh, this month, and uh, trying to adjust accordingly. Although, it's like it's like that meme that's been going around that um, it says something along the lines of I've been ordering so much from Amazon lately that if a llama shows up on my porch, I'm not going to be surprised. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the same way I'm taking this whole 2020 thing that who knows what the hell is going to happen next you know it's just we have no idea there's no way to know yeah yeah it's uh, been one thing after another you know and we hope everybody out there is uh, staying healthy and safe wearing masks when you go out I know it sucks Uh, believe you me if anybody knows how much having to wear a mask out in the middle of summer, sucks. It's me. You know, I I work outside for a living, and uh, every customer I go into, I'm wearing a mask. You know, to protect both myself and them, because I'm going to multiple customers on a daily basis, and you never know what might hop right on you. And uh, you know, all I can say is, do it. You know, I I know it sucks, but do it. Wear a mask. It's not a hoax. It's not some conspiracy. You know, our country out of all the world has the most cases because we're being the most stubborn about it. So put your pride aside. You know, think of it this way. And I I actually saw a a posting on this online. Uh, It showed a, a picture of a soldier in battle fatigues and, uh, you know, I think he's wearing a face mask, uh, not a face mask, but a, like a gas mask or something. Mm-hmm. And the guy, uh, the, the posting said, you know, if you can, if the soldier can wear this for eight hours at a time, you can wear a mask for 15 minutes when you run into Walmart. Right. And it's very true. You know, we, you know, our, 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 uh, our military is out there every day doing everything they can to keep us safe and protected. You know, the very least we can do is keep our fellow Americans safe and protected by wearing a mask. So yeah, cause what's the point of them going to all the trouble mm-hmm. of making sure that they follow all the protocols only for us to be falling apart on it? Yeah. You know, at you know, the same time. I mean, you're, you're seeing so many cases on an uptick now lately you know, and, and, you know, we live in Michigan, and Michigan was hard hit early on, and then we got a, a 
got it rained under pretty well, but even we're starting to have an uptick again. And it's just, it's frustrating to me because all the work we put in since March collectively as a community, uh, you know, social distancing, staying home, wearing masks, disinfecting, uh, gallons and gallons of hand sanitizer, you know, um, just for us to get lazy and complacent now, it's going to put us right back to square one, you know, and you're seeing that. You're seeing that in other parts of the country. You're seeing it in Florida and Arizona and California, uh, I think Texas, uh, Oklahoma, you know, and like I said, the cases are starting to tick up in Michigan again. So, you know, do just do your part. You know, uh, I hate to be on a soapbox this early on a, on a Saturday and, I hope that didn't turn you off to anything, but, you know, I'm just speaking my mind because I care about you, the listener, and want you guys to be happy and healthy and be able to see your family and be there for your family. Um, You know, it's more than just a flu. So uh, that's, that's my piece. I have said my piece. All righty. Okay. Well, now that you have said your piece. Yes. Why don't we go ahead and bring our guest in? All right. Um, we are almost positive. We couldn't find any documentation to prove it, but we are almost positive this is his second time on the show. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking that because I remember him quite well from his first book and his website. Um, he's a upstanding member of the mental health community on Twitter, mm-hmm. and um, he's also on Instagram, too, I believe. And um, he does a really great job, and he's got this new book out, uh, How to Tell Depression to Piss Off, 40 Ways to Get Your Life Back. That's a great title. It is a great title. And we're we're really lucky to get a chance to talk to him about this, because he is all the way across the pond. So could you please welcome into the show Mr. James Withy? <sighs> <laughs> Hello there, guys. It's lovely to be back on. <laughs> hey James, how you doing? Thanks for uh, thanks for being with us. It's it, yeah, it was right. funny. We it's kind of kind of embarrassing, but funny. You know, we're looking at each other like we've talked to James before, haven't we? Yeah. Yes, you have. No. You have. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, you definitely. We yeah, talked about <laughs> we talked about your first book, the first go around, right? Exactly. Yeah, we talked about the recovery letters and and website the first time around so yeah absolutely so that's why i want to come back because it was so great so yeah it's lovely to be here awesome well we're happy to have you back sir um we're both going to swoon over your uh wonderful british accent <laughs> like we please do. do please do that <laughs> yeah yep, we will um i'm not going to insult you by trying to do my best yeah, poor job don't. of one myself please don't so, I'll have to smack you. Yeah, she'll smack me. Um, <laughs> I, I really don't think it's going to take much to incite that today, anyway. But you know, so uh, so how how are things over there with uh, all of this that's going on? Is it are you guys still seeing a lot of cases popping up, or have you guys finally gotten a handle on it and a better handle than we do? Well, I, I think we're. I think cases are still going down, um, so we're kind of at a point of things are starting to reopen. So, uh, where I work in the library, we're open in a, a kind of fashion, and gyms and pubs are reopening, but with just restrictions. So, so yeah, we're kind of on a downward turn, and and things are opening up a bit more. But then you sort of hear news about you know, rates for infection starting to rise. And so, yeah, things are, things are you know, on the face of it are, are getting better. Um, there's still, you know, restrictions in place. Um, yeah, I guess we're just hoping there won't be a second spike here. Is that that's sort of why everyone's sort of crossing their, crossing their hands and fingers and hoping that, you know, as you were saying, Joe, by wearing masks and distancing and all that kind of stuff is that we won't get a second spike. And, yeah, it's just it's just been such an extraordinary thing, hasn't it? it it's it's mm-hmm. you know, it was such a loss of it was such a bereavement and an actual bereavement for so many people who have died, and then for those of us, 
you know, a bereavement of our lives that were, you know, it, it's, it's just, it's just extraordinary. And it's a lot of processing I found, you know, I know certainly I think sort of mid April here, we were getting the greatest amount of deaths and it would sort of be about, you know, 800, a thousand people a day. And you're just trying to sort of compute that, you know, trying to get your head around that amount of people dying a day is, it's just an extraordinary, terrible thing. So, yeah, yeah, there's a there's so much processing I think that we need to do at the moment around how much has changed, and you know, that's it's just going to take such a long time to process that, and also to try and get back to some kind of normality. But I don't know when that will be because I'm I'm suspecting you know winter we're going to be struck again. So I think things are going to be difficult for a while to come. Yeah. yeah, we're we're seeing it. You know, some people are calling it a second wave over here, but oh, okay. I still I think it's still a continuation of the first wave. You know, honestly, uh, it's it's just uh, my I I love being an American, but sometimes it's taxing. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many different. Uh, viewpoints, different uh, different opinions on all this stuff, and we are a stubborn people. And you know, you could have the facts right there in front of a person, and they'll be like, "Nope, the guy's green." You know, I know, I know. So, so it's been it's been tough. It's been a real, real tough to pill to swallow, and then you know, you add all the all the race stuff. Uh, on top yeah. of it, and uh, absolutely, yeah, it's been it's been crazy over here. Mm-hmm. So just saying, absolutely. um, you know, oh, I, I, uh, yeah, I think you guys have had a really really tough time, and certainly, you know, as said, you know, the the Black Lives Matter movement has has spread so globally out of something so dreadful. Um, so there seems to be this sort of huge, you know, sort of living history that we're experiencing, you know, which is kind of bewildering and baffling and you know at, at the same time so yeah it's it's such a period of dramatic change isn't it that it's 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 hard to get your head around yeah but you know it, i think this time with all the with all the the racial stuff and and black lives matter uh really taking off i i think this time maybe some real change might might happen. At least I'm hoping. I'm I'm so hoping for it. You know, it's mm-hmm. it's been rough, yeah. man. It's it's been it's been really really rough. You know, seeing what people have been going through, and it's been really eye opening hearing some of the stories that people are coming out with, and it's just it's it's been amazing. So it's, yeah, the the more the more you kind of read about it, the more cases that 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 you know I've looked into and uh, the where black people are being killed by the police and and it's just extraordinary it's just sort of mind blowing mind blowing stuff and you know, mm. and yeah i guess the only hope within that is that yeah that that something finally has changed and you sort of have to hold on to that hope don't you it's a bit like with mental illness you know you have to hold on to some hope that things are going to change you know and and that something will be learned yeah. from this you know? yeah, yeah for sure absolutely well, if you don't have any questions for us, sir, we are going to jump into our questions for you. Go for it. Okay. Well, we probably asked you this the first time we went around. So just in <laughs> case there are any any folks that did not get the answer to this question, uh, we'll journey begin. Sorry, Rebecca, didn't hear you say that again. Where does your mental health journey begin? Uh, do you know, it, it actually, when I, the more I think about it, it began as a child. And, um, and I can remember, you know, times when I was really young, so kind of five, six, of, you know, having that feeling of just being very, my mood being very low and very lonely and not knowing what that feeling was and, and, and kind of, it, you know, it, it was depression, but, but I had, you know, no name for it and didn't know what it was. So it, I remember that feeling from a very, very young child, you know, and then it, it progressed in various life events. So my, my dad dying when I was five and, 
and then you know coming out as gay and various life events sort of impacted on my mental health but I think it was something that has always been around for me and I can see sort of looking at my family history that there's there's a clear pattern of you know family history of mental illness and yeah it sort of kind of progressed so I I had a a near suicide attempt when I was about 14 and then when I was at university um, had sort of strong suicidal feelings then and then I had um, anorexia when I was about 21 and then you know what's really curious about this is that I still didn't define myself as somebody with a mental illness I think because you know the, you know I'm I'm sort of I'm so I'm one of my 48 47 and so you know the internet wasn't around a lot of that time and you know certainly man, the stigma around mental illness was so severe that you didn't want to be associated with somebody who had a mental health or a mental illness problem so I never the shame was so great that I never saw myself as somebody with a mental illness or a mental health problem so I never got help um, you know, and I just kind of carried on and then, um, and then I guess in my twenties and thirties, um, it was relatively stable. So I was sort of working full time. I had periods in counseling, um, I had quite a lot of anxiety around, but was kind of manageable. And then when I got to about 40, um, I suddenly had a huge kind of, you know, breakdown in terms of my depression. Um, and then that's when, you know, things got really, really severe. So, yeah, multiple suicide attempts and, and yeah, crisis teams and, you know, psychiatric hospital stays. So, you know, I look back at that sort of 48 years and, and mental illness has always been with me, but it's not been until the last, you know, maybe eight, nine, ten years that I sort of self-identified as somebody with a mental illness. And I, and I think, to me, what that shows is the you know, the, the stigma is so strong and has been so strong about mental illness that, you know, I didn't even want to conceive it as I might be somebody with a mental illness, you know. Um, that's, right. how, that's how powerful it is. Um, and, and also, you know, there were no kind of positive examples of anybody with mental health and, you know, nothing was talked about on television. And, you know, my images of mental health were, you know, people in a psychiatric hospital and sort of, you know, almost kind of Victorian like you know people in restraints and you know you know and so mm -hmm. I'd you know I'd, like why would I want to be associated with that you know so it took me a long yeah. long time to self-identify really and say yeah actually I have I have depression and and uh this is this is this is what this is what's going on would you say that we've made any steps from from your past experience you know of struggling with with getting help, do you think we've made any positive steps in the d right direction for people to get help? I, you know, I think we have. I, I think we have. I think, I think there's been big steps, and I think there are big steps to go. I think it would be very dangerous to get complacent around where we've come. So I think mm -hmm. we are, you know, much more able to talk about this stuff and social media helps with that and you have celebrities and well-known people sort of coming out about about their mental illness and mental health problems and you know it is easier to talk about that and to get help than it was I think the issues now are around you know the quality of help that we get and um, things like antidepressants and, and, and their effectiveness and and um, and still, you know, I, there is still still stigma around. You know, we haven't beaten the battle of stigma at all, you know. And, and shame and stigma is, you know, from ourselves, is, is one of the most powerful ones. And then we have sort of from society as well. So, you know, it's not as if we've overcome that. You know, there's a, there's a lot, long way to go with that stuff. But I think in particular with um, the kind of more psychotic side of, of mental illness, so schizophrenia and, um, borderline personality disorder and, and um, less in inverted compliance palatable, you know, mental, mental illnesses that people understand less. So I think there's a long way to go with with, with those with those type of illnesses. Um, but I, you know, I still come across people that don't understand depression and don't understand why I'm feeling a certain way or you know why I've had suicide attempts and um, and kind of that's 
also to do with you know, using depression as an adjective and that with depression we don't have a separate word that, that also isn't used in sort of common language. So it becomes hard to sort of differentiate between oh, I'm depressed because my, my football team lost a game to mm-hmm. you know, I and, and then I have depression, you know, and, and the two things being so yeah. dramatic, dramatically different. So we can't we can't get complacent, which is why, you know, shows like yours are so important. We have to kind of keep going with this stuff. Um, and yeah. research is really important. You know, we I would once talk to a, uh, a sort of neuro, neuro, neuropsychiatrist about and depressants and 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 I was talking about how. I keep having to change them because they stop working. And he's going, yeah, we know that. We just don't know why. And he was saying, look, the stage that we're at, really, it's like you've got a an engine in a car that's not working. And, you know, you're just liberally sprinkling oil around it and kind of hoping for the best. And that's kind of where we are with, with medication. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when the medications that we're taking are only partly effective, you know. So there's still you know a long way to go yeah it's it's you touched on a lot of different things with that and you know the 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 thing with with all of it is yeah there there's a lot of stigma that needs to be overcome i think the conversation is finally starting to get a little more normalized and people are more comfortable coming forward and saying, hey, I need help, I'm struggling, and what have you. But there are still people that will look down their nose on the whole thing and, oh, that can't be me, and, you know, different things like that. And trying to get more comfortable with talking about it is key. You know, it's our goal is to have the conversation be as common as, you know, I have to go to the eye doctor. You know, I have to go to the dentist. You know, well, I've got to go to my psychiatrist. I, you know, need to get my meds adjusted. And that's that's been a, a tricky thing, too, you know, is you find stuff that uh, works and you find stuff that works for a time and then doesn't work, you know. And people seem to forget, you know, our bodies become uh, – What's the word I'm trying to think of uh, where you're, you become used to the medication? Not medication resistant, but... Tolerance. Um, to, yeah. Yeah, tolerance, yeah, tolerance. That's the word. Thank you. You know, you build up a tolerance to it, and it's like anything. It's like like if you're drinking and you're an alcoholic, you develop an alcohol tolerance, and there are functional alcoholics out there that can, you know drive to work and work all day and come home and they're blotto the entire time. But, you know, it's, it's a matter of patience and finding your way through with the medication and, you know, realizing that, okay, I can't get frustrated. This didn't work for me. Maybe the next one will, you know, and being able to recognize when a medication stops working for you and it's not being effective. You know, that's a, that's an important thing too. Um, but, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> I, I, I will, I will say this though. I think that mental illnesses of varying degrees, be it anxiety, depression, uh, eating disorders, you name it, um, are a lot more prevalent and always have more prevalent than anybody would let on and I think that has to do with you know the stigma of of talking about it or not talking about it you know um, we're lucky that we live in an age where it's finally you know at least a little more acceptable to talk about it and to shed light on it um, but I think it's something that people have wrestled with time immemorial you know uh, you, you okay. mentioned having a my family history. I know Beck's family, there's a family history. I'm sure my family has a family history. I know my dad had anxiety. You know, um, I know the the last few years of his life, his doctor had him on Xanax. So, you know, that's that just 
points to, you know, there's stuff going on. So, you know, yeah. So there's a, there's a worldwide history, you know, and and there was one other thing I want to say, and then we're going to go to break. And that's that, you know, James, you, you mentioned that for you, it was really in the last 10 years or so uh, since turning 40 that you've really been able to, uh, you know, have it be an acknowledged thing. And I think that, number one, I think that's true for a a lot of us as we get older, we start to realize, we start to see patterns, we start to open ourselves up to the possibility, you know, just from the point of view of being older and having the life experience, you know, and we've, we've noticed on this show, usually when we ask, the the question that we asked you about where the mental health journey begins, if it's not an early childhood thing, then it, then it is something that affects 17, 18, 19. Right. You know, I I think it goes hand in hand with puberty, but the thing that we've not talked about is that the way the rest of your body changes over time, you know, uh, physical things, you know, you develop, uh, sciatica, you know, all of a sudden you're having a hard time walking or, you know, you get, uh, you know, coronary disease or, you know, breathing problems, you know, you, you name it with, with the physical stuff that comes with getting older and having getting older suck. Um, the one thing that we've never really brought up is that, you know, the mental effects of getting older, you know, um, your outlook when you're 20 and you're dealing with anxiety and you're dealing with uh, depression and mood swings is a whole different mindset when you're over 40 and you're dealing with those things. Cause you've got the life experience and you've got the, uh, you know, more responsibilities and, and this and that. And so it takes on a different life of its own, you know, and, and maybe you, you handle things better in your twenties and all of a sudden you've got these responsibilities. You've got, house payments and car payments and child care and putting your kid through school and you name it, you know, and once all that compounds on you and knowing that, you know, you've got more years behind you than you've got ahead of you, that really takes a toll. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. I think it's true. I I think you, you, you know, so many changes take place as, as you, you know, your body's aging and, you, and, you, and you're aging. And, yeah, you do get perspectives that are useful. But, you know, there's also, yeah, you, your relation to your mental health changes, but also your mental health changes, you know, as, as, as your body's changing and your brain's changing, you know. So I, I, think, I think I'm not sure we're doing enough really to, to help older people with mental health problems. I think, I think it's we sort of, there's a lot of concentration on, young people which is of course absolutely right because hopefully we can do a lot of prevention work but um i think as as people get into retirement and you know we know that you know mental health problems are are huge after people retire for example and and then you know loved ones start to die and you know and and you know mental health and mental illness problems can can pop up drastically at that point so yeah we can't take our foot off the gas really with this stuff we've, we've, we've got to keep, we've got to keep going indeed and on that note we're going to take a break <laughs> what do you people think of that <laughs> so uh, uh check out uh maniac by unsung lily and we will be back on the other side yep Just a steel town girl on a Saturday night Looking for the fight of a life In a real time world no one sees her at all They all say she's crazy Locking rhythms to the beat of her heart Changing movement into the light She is dancing to the danger zone When the dancer becomes a dance you can cut you like a knife If a gift becomes a fire On a wire between will and what will be She's a maniac, maniac on the floor And she's dancing like she never danced before She's a maniac 
Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. I'm Joe. She's Rebecca. She's she's my baby. She's so stinking cute. That's right. I say it every time because I mean it every time because <laughs> I love her. I love you too. And on the line is uh, the lovely and talented Mr. James Withy. Hello. Hello. Uh, how's she going, eh? He's not Canadian, honey. No, he's not, but, you know, still. I can still say that like that. It's still a valid greeting. So that was a really cool version of Maniac, i got to admit. Yeah, that was, that was interesting. I was, uh, you know, telling our producer, Scott, and uh, our PA, Gloria, that, you know, I remember when that song first came out. And yeah. I'm sure yeah, Scott me does too. as well. Yeah, because yeah. you know, we're old. <laughs> so... Older than dirt. Yep, still pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so that was that was pretty hip. I uh, I enjoyed that thoroughly. All right, so James, um, what made you decide to become an author? Oh, do you know what? I think I think after after my first book came out, which is like a collection of of, of letters um, addressed to people experiencing depression, I kind of wanted to write a book that kind of sort of collected all my thoughts and ways that I managed depression. And I realized that I was using all these different ways every day to sort of fight depression. And, and I thought, actually, what I want to do is I want to, write, I want to write all these down. And so I started to do that. And I was like, oh, that's another way. And that's another way. And, and eventually, you know, I, I, got, I got to about 40 ways. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm using all these tools and techniques, you know, some things at different times, but I, I use them all at some point. And I thought, actually, I want hmm. to 
I want to write them down, but I also want to share them, you know, because I know that certainly when I've been recommended, I don't know about you guys, but when I've been recommended books about depression, certainly when I was first acutely ill, they were, they were like enormous sort of 500 page books. And I was like, how am I supposed to read that? You know, I haven't got, mm-hmm. my concentration has gone. I can't, I can't right. read a thing. And I was expected to read this huge book and there was homework involved and it was like, oh, you know, like, there's no way I can read this. So I also wanted to write a really accessible you know, book where you can just flick through and just read. You know, the chapters are really short, sometimes just one or two pages. Um, you don't need to read it from cover to cover. So there isn't that sort of stress of, oh, I need to start page one and then I get to page 400. It's, it's, the book doesn't work like that at all. You can just flick through and find a particular way that you want to read. Um, because I know, you know, with depression, you just, you can't concentrate. You're, you're, you're trying to function, you know, and your brain is battling against you. So but I right. wanted people, people to be able to get, to try different things. Um, and some will work and some don't. But there are all ways that I try to, to manage my depression. And, um, yeah, and I wanted to inject loads of humor into it as well. Cause I, you know, sometimes reading, a book about depression is a, is a tough read, you know, especially if you've got depression. Mm-hmm. So, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. it, you know, obviously it can be really validating, but also it can be tough. So I've thrown in lots of humor with it, lots of kind of dark humor, um, which is, you know, also one of the ways that I manage my depression is by making jokes about it and, and, you know, joking about it with my husband and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I wanted it to, I wanted it to be funny as well. So, it was, you know, I wanted there to be a balance, obviously, of you know, compassion and empathy, but with some humour. Um, and, you know, well, I, I certainly hope I've achieved that. Um, I think that's, that's really important when we're talking about these kind of serious subjects is, is that you kind of need a break from that as well. And also that we can make fun of ourselves and, and use humour as a coping mechanism. So, yeah, it was great. I, I, I wrote it and then I sent it to a publisher and they were happy and they've been very supportive and you know yeah it's 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 doing really well it's being translated into other languages and stuff so yeah i'm 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 really i'm really pleased with it it's um it's been great and i the feedback has been that yeah it's been easy to read and accessible and funny and and people can try out just different ways and different things that work i think a lot of time we I know certainly when i was first ill i was like what do i do you know what do i do about this you know and and, you know, I would have sort of health professionals going, oh, well, have you had a bath? And I was going, no, I need, I need, <laughs> I need something a bit more, <laughs> you know, it's not just about having some chamomile tea. You know, I need, I need techniques. I need ways to manage this. Um, I need to be told yeah. what, what to do. Um, and so kind of what I've ended up doing with both books really is, is kind of writing books that I need, you know, that I've needed and then sort of set them loose in the world because those books haven't been there. Um, and so, yeah, it's been, it was, it was fantastic to write it and yeah, it, it's, it's, it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, 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 you know, I use both books, you know, for myself all the time. So, you know, I had a day last week where, you know, I was struggling and I was thinking, okay, so, you know, which, which way, which of the 40 ways are you going to try today? So, you know, that particular day, yeah. I, I I tried getting angry at my depression, which works quite a lot, which is the, you know, fighting against it and saying to it, you're not, you're not going to beat me. I'm not going to be taken down by you. You know, I'm going to do the opposite of what you're telling me to do. And because it's like, you know, depression's like a kind of, it's like a ninja, you know, it's like an assassin that somehow got into your brain, you know, it's, it's, try, it's trying to take you down. And, you know, yeah. mm-hmm. we, we, we might accept that, you know, the ninja's there trying to take us down, but actually lying down to it isn't always going to work and certainly doesn't work for me. And, and one of the ways that I manage it is to fight back and go, right, okay, I'm having this thought, I'm having this feeling, I'm going to battle against that and I'm not, I'm not going to be beaten by depression. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, that's... Um... I wish I could get that into my head. I mean, there was a, a time early on when I was younger that I could just overcome symptoms and 
just move forward and do whatever I was going to do. But as I've got harder and harder and harder, and I find myself really struggling to, you know, complete simple tasks on some days. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. whereas when I was in my 20s, you know, I was in my 20s, it was, it was no big deal. I just... You know, I had just been diagnosed, and they gave me this pill, and I figured, oh, this is, you know, the magic pill, and it's going to cure it, and I'm going to be fine, and I'm going to be able to go and do my thing. And here I am 37 years (laughs) later, something like that. that, um, 27. 27, thank you, that uh, those things are still plaguing me, so... I, I, yeah. I, I know. I, I think, and I think it's all. I think it's all relative, isn't it? So I, you know, I have days where I, I just I struggle to get up. I struggle to get out of bed. I struggle to have a shower, to make meals. You know, I I once spent eight hours trying to put a plant in my garden, and I talk about that in the book. You know, it took me eight hours to plant the blooming plant in the garden because depression was going you're useless, the plot will die, just stay in bed. You know, and it takes a huge amount of energy to counteract it. But I think also those small tasks aren't small, you know, they're massive. So getting to the, to the shops to get food or making yourself a meal are you know, things that kind of people without our illnesses do without thinking. But for us, that's massive, you know, that's climbing a mountain stuff. And I think we've got to right. put stuff into context you know so when I you know do manage to make myself breakfast when I'm having a really bad day I I think to myself this isn't just you know making breakfast this is massive because it's taken so much energy to make massive so I need to give myself some points here because it's it's not as simple as that for us you know it's just it's it's those are mountains that we're climbing every day that other people do without thinking so context of, of it is, is, is really important. It really is. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's hard, and Beck and I have had this conversation more times than I can count, it's hard to not beat yourself up over stuff that you're not doing, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's easier uh, just laying in bed or you feel like you're walking around with a weighted blanket over your shoulders or... Yeah you know, any number of things. And, you know, I, I tell her constantly, you know, if all you do today is breathe, you've done enough. Absolutely. You know, that's the important thing. You know, stuff will get done. You know, either I'll do it or when you're feeling better and you're better, in a better state of mind, you'll get up and do it. Yeah. And that's very true, you know. So it's hard to not beat yourself up over stuff, but it's also, you know, just – a matter of being kind to yourself and, you know, when you do feel good enough to get up and, and do something like, you know, get out of bed, take a shower, uh, go into a different room, you know, um, those are small victories. And, you know, those that are not afflicted, you know, they take that stuff for granted, you know, and those of us that are, you know, we need to celebrate them as small victories and tell ourselves it's okay to feel okay about that. You know, that's another thing that I know Beck has beaten herself up over in the past and I've I've done it from time to time too, is thinking that it's not we shouldn't be allowed to feel good because mm-hmm. we're afflicted with this with depression with yeah. you know anxiety you know we we have to be miserable all the time well right. who says mm-hmm. you know that's that's garbage that's our our mental illness you know telling us the lie you know um we we should absolutely be able to get some kind of joy out of life absolutely mm-hmm. absolutely i i think i think it's and certainly what I mean, you know, this, none of these, this stuff is easy, you know, and it, and it's kind of yeah. what I, what I try and do is, 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 is definitely, yeah, focus on, on having some happiness, but I kind of almost go the other way with this and, and try and have moments of ecstatic joy, you know, 
in, in between my periods of depression. So, and that can be really small stuff, you know, that I'll see. So, you know, sometimes and I'll write these down, the moments where I've experienced real joy. So, you know, I, I, I saw a dog once with this, you know, just enormous, enormous stick in its, in its mouth, you know, running along the road, <laughs> as happy as anything. Or, you know, I, I, there's, uh, as a very famous ice cream parlor really near where I live, and, and there was a, a woman who was oh, easily in her 90s with a massive, massive chocolate ice cream, grinning her head off. And, you know, and I write those <laughs> moments down because they, to me, that they, those are the stuff that fuels me, you know, when my depression's bad. It's, it's not the kind of day-to-day happiness. It's the kind of extreme moments of joy and, and, and witnessing. And, and, and it's like having a really good belly laugh where you're almost crying. You know, that, those, kind of, those kind of experiences of joy are stuff that sustains me and I think that, that that helped me get through and I write those down so I can remember when I'm in the depths of my depression when depression is saying you're useless you know you should die you're never going to get better I've got some evidence of going well I, I I do experience joy you know I look look at these things I've written on my phone you know look at the dog mm-hmm. and the woman with the ice cream and, and various other things and I go I can experience joy and we need to Kind of needs that armor with depression because you know, it's giving you a hard time and then you're giving yourself a hard time because you, you can't do things and so we have to have weapons at our disposal to, to fight back you know um and that and that is hard work in itself but I, I think hopefully what it then does is that it gives you those moments of joy to have and that creates meaning and 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 then we can kind of build from there but you know, I have days where I just give in to my depression. I just and I just go, okay, this is this is not happening today. I'm going to go to bed. I'm just going to go to bed and go to sleep because, you know, okay, we're, we're going to have a, de- a day where depression wins and that's it. You know, but but it's yeah, yeah, and that's okay. You know, it's it's, it's about trying to tell myself that that's okay that I have a day in bed and I sleep and you know I eat yogurt in bed and you know it's like that that's mm-hmm. what happens. I watch Netflix and that's it. Um, but, I, I, but that's that's self care, you know, and we're constantly being berated by our illness to go. Well, you should be doing yoga, and you should be, you know, running your half marathon at this point, and you, you know, you, you should be running for president, you know, or whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Right. We have mm-hmm. we have the we have this voice that's going. That's not okay to do that. You know, you should be doing something else. Look at all these people who are jogging around the park. You should be one of them. You know. Rather than going, right. you have to nurture yourself. You have to, you know, energy with with mental illness is so important, and having those moments to gain energy to tackle it, you know, and, and in any way that possible, you can do that. You know, we have to pace ourselves at a very, in a very very different way, and that feels, you know, you know, it, when you compare it to somebody else without those illnesses, it feels very different, but have to put in context what we're going through you know so what what would be your advice for um someone that might be looking into writing a book especially about a uh, mental illness or mental health condition you know i th- i think a just write, writing about your mental health anyway is just very 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 cathartic you know it's just a great way of managing your own mental health so Certainly for me, my my reading ability was still affected, but it was affected massively. But I was able to write, and it, it and it was very very cathartic because I think I think because there was so much going on in my head, I wasn't able to take much in, but I was able to get stuff out. You know, it was like a purging. So yeah, mm-hmm. I, th- I would say, yeah, you know, writing about about your experience in mental health, telling your story. And then publishing it in any way, you know, in a blog, whatever way you do that, is really powerful. Because the more stories that we hear, the more we normalize, you know, the illnesses that we're going through. But also, if you're going to write about it, write about it in a really accessible way. You know, if you want people to read it, if you want to try and get it published and read it, other people to read it, make it accessible to your audience. So, you know, if you're writing a very theoretical, turgid long book about about and then the odds on that people are not going to read it because they won't have the concentration to do it so make it accessible right. 
make it very very accessible to to your audience and think about well, actually you know what can we read and what can't we you know when we're in that state so yeah stories stories are really important you know humor is really important making it accessible is really important um, and also recognize that you know if it if it doesn't get published you know that's fine because actually writing it down is really important because the mm-hmm. act of writing is is a fantastic tool and and it also makes you reflect on your experience and how far you've come so i know when i was writing about a lot of my my experiences in this book that i was able to look back and go yeah i, I got through that experience it's, it's not it's definitely not a case of i no longer have suicidal thoughts you know i still do you know almost mm-hmm. daily you know i have you know it's not a case of you know depression hasn't gone it's with me i wish it would go that would be wonderful but it hasn't yeah mm-hmm. it's just that i've tooled up you know i've just got more tools to hand to tackle it and and the longer it goes on i've got more weapons to use but yeah i would say you know write it down like you know start with a blog i started with a blog you know 10 years ago and and it was great just to let out what i was what i was what i was feeling and and a lot of the experiences that i went through i think those are really important to talk about a lot of the time with in the UK, you know, psychiatric care is, is underfunded, so we can get loads of really negative experiences with that, and that, and that yeah. can be traumatic in itself. So, you know, write about those as well. Write about those experiences because those need to be those to be processed. Because it's it's hard when you go to to a place, a professional, or in, you know, a hospital or wherever it might be, where you're wanting to get care and compassion because the fact that you're unwell and you don't always get met with that. So we need to talk about that stuff too. So yeah, write it down, make it into a blog, and then and then just put your feelers out and think. Oh, you know, is this is this is could this be a book? It's it's good to look at the competition really and see. Well, what is there a gap in the market? Publishers are always looking for a gap in the market of a, a slightly different take on mental illness. And if you can find a slightly different take, then you're more likely to get something published rather than just duplicating what's been there before mm-hmm. yeah. yeah exactly so we're um getting pretty close to the end of the show so um i wanted to give you the opportunity to give out your social media information for anyone that might be looking to speak with you oh yeah no absolutely so um my 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 twitter handle is um at james w withy so yeah you can find me there um, it's the same for Instagram, and the Recovery Letters uh, Twitter account is at Recovery Letters, um, and the Instagram account is uh, at the Recovery Letters, I think. And then, yeah, you can also um, a, a website which is just jameswithy.com. You can contact me on there. So yeah, come and say hello. That, that would be lovely. All right. So real quick. Uh, let us know what you have in store for you next. So yeah, so I'm, I'm yeah, more books. <laughs> so um, <laughs> I, I I have a book, a sort of recovery letters two ish book coming out called What I Do to Get Through, and that's that's published next year. Um, and that's all about how we use hobbies and activities to help our mental health. So counts from people who who do knitting and running and mountaineering and crocheting and cooking and, and people talking about all the different ways that they use to get through and help their mental health and, and that's been a lovely project because we've got just some amazing accounts of how people use hobbies and activities to get through and and then I'm also starting to write um, a book specifically about suicide and dark thoughts in, in a similar way to how to tell depression to piss off so kind of injected with humor and again kind of techniques that you can use to kind of combat dark thoughts so so yeah and hopefully um i'm just sort of in the process of getting a publisher for that one so yeah more books coming out which is which is lovely which is a real privilege yeah that's, that's awesome, awesome. <laughs> you <owe me> a <laughs> yeah we're very happy for you for that and uh definitely reach out when those other books come out because we'd love to have you back on the show oh, yeah we back. uh we, We'd love to put some spotlight on them, uh, just like we have with 
How to Tell Depression to Piss Off, 40 Ways to Get Your Life Back. I love that title. And the recovery letters. And the recovery letters as well, yes. Um, but Right. Yeah, I, I I think I think your how to book is is going to be a, a necessary tool for people. They should get out and get it and read it, and maybe they'll find something that'll work for them where they've previously had no success. Mm-hmm. Um, and really quick, where can they get your book? So yeah, so you can because of COVID, actually, there's been some problems getting the book over in in the US actually so so yeah um, that is being dealt with so soon you you can be able to get it on Amazon and or you know those those usual places you can certainly get it on eBay but because of COVID there have been loads of delays with kind of uh, shipping it over to the US and stuff so yeah we're getting there (laughs) we're getting there with it Um, yeah you can get hold of you can get hold of the recovery letters very easily Barnes and Noble or Amazon or, or, or kind of anywhere else. Um, the new book, yeah, we're we're still working on it, but you can certainly get it on eBay. It's on eBay, so you can certainly get it by there. Um, and we're working on getting it right. more available in the US. Yeah. Sweet. Sounds good. Well, you stay on the line, good sir, and we're going to end out the yeah. show with the song "Lay Me Down" by Ben. He's a wood. We'll catch you guys next week. Have a great week. Stay healthy. Stay safe. And uh, have a good weekend. Holding out for everything that I've been. The pull is strong, surrendering into it. Reaching out and naming truth. To be with you is my only desire. You're everything I need. Here in hollow again. To pretend, but I know I'm still breathing. As I break all the faults to faith anymore, I still need you to break it. I need a night, need a night of whispers. Come lay me down for the peace I'm missing. Can you save me from tonight, from the Pretend, but I know I'm still breathing As I break all the fall